Hello again, party people. It is your boy BQ. And you are seeing my face once again back here on the Negative BQ YouTube channel. This is your Impact Lounge Impact review for November 21st, 2024. So welcome back here to the channel. If it's your first time, consider hitting the subscribe button. We're talking TNA Impact each and every week. And no one can do it like we do it here on the channel. So uh, not a lot of news that I feel the need to talk about. So we're going to jump right into the episode. DNA Impact. Ooh. So the first match of this thing was Alicia Edwards. Uh, hi, baby. And she took on the TNA Knockouts champion, Masha Slamovich. Meet Fran Stalinaskovich Davidovich. And the stipulations for this match was no disqualification garbage match. Get that garbage out of here! This match wasn't that bad, actually. And this isn't just me being like an Alicia Stan or whatever. Um, when they first announced that it was going to be no disqualification, I really wasn't into that. You know, that's not really my favorite stipulation in the world. It was kind of an excuse because, you know, doing Masha versus Alicia... You know, one of them's a lot better than the other. So it's, you know, sometimes you got to uh, cover things up with with stipulations like this. So that's what they did. No disqualification. And they needed to get this match out of the way. You know, it was, it was clearly they used to be a tag team. Had to have them go against each other. They needed to get it out of the way so they could move on to Masha versus Jordan Grace. And then whatever she's got coming up after Jordan Grace. Now, they completely slapped us in the face, though, as fans, because... They promoted this match as Alicia versus Masha. Whoever wins is going to move on to turning point to take on Jordan Grace. We knew exactly who was going to win. The no confusion about this. When you're looking at this graphic, we know who is going to win. You know, so, you know, kind of silly that they did that whole thing. But it's whatever. It's all good. Masha ended up winning with a package pile driver. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, they did not. So there, there's two ways in TNA that you finish a match, R really in wrestling in general, a roll-up or a finisher. There's very few other instances where we see anything different than that. And I th so I thought that the way that she hit Alicia a couple times with a kendo stick, package pile driver, win, you know, it, it kind of gave her a decisive win, but it didn't, it wasn't just the played out like, oh, let me hit the snow plow now. You know what I mean? So I thought that was really cool. They did the whole tail the tape thing before this match here. And and I kind of laugh because, <laughs> you know, it says like finisher snowplow, Alicia finisher delish. I'm the biggest Alicia Edwards fan in the world. You guys know this. I have no clue what the fuck that move is. I have no clue what that finish is. None. I know that at one point she has done a flatliner. She has done... She had a neck breaker that she used for one episode on a explosion. It was kind of like a ravishing Rick Rude style uh, standing neck breaker. And they said that was her new finisher, but we never seen it again. And then uh, I know she did like a the sit down face buster, which I think is one of the worst. A, a lot of, like Brie Bella used to do it. One of the worst moves in wrestling and no girl actually can make it look good. That might be what Delish is. But um. All those moves I named aren't going to beat anybody. After the match, and this is a theme throughout the show, every single match felt like there was a run-in afterwards. And of course, after Masha gets the win, we get the run-in from Tasha Steele. We got a badass over here. That lasts for all of five seconds, and then we get Jordan Grace's music. Get me out of here! So they come in, they run the two of them off, and then they have a moment in the ring where Jordan is standing at the belt. There's a lot of paint by numbers things on this episode. And a lot of episodes have a lot of paint by number thing, but uh, paint by number type of things, but the go home shows typically have a lot of them. And, and this is one of them too. You know, she picks up the bell. She's looking at it all adoringly, then gives it to Masha, whatever. So we know that that is going to be the match at turning point. Remember that was a blood feud like two weeks ago, <laughs> like two or three weeks ago. Uh, Masha had the kill list on uh, on her wall, and and now they're um, they're best friends all over again. 
Tom Hannafin. We do not make Tom, fun of Tom Hannafin on this show. Um, but he did say, we're going to hear from Mike Santana after he dispatched Casey Navarro last week. Who, who talks like that? After this, we have the rascals backstage. They're standing in front of green light. In one word, would I use dope? Nope. And they're, Zach Wentz is cutting this entire promo pretty much, but he's got Kushida with him and he's got Trey Miguel with him. Kushida's standing there pretending like he has a clue what anybody's saying. Uh, Trey Miguel's just standing in the background. And one thing I thought really interesting, I know they're going to have this upcoming six-man match, but Wentz is listing off their accolades and he did not list at all that either any of the three of them were ever X Division champion. It was It was like... I'm a two-time tag team champion, two-time NXT tag team champion. He's a two-time tag team champion. He's a Japan DD Pro. Ch- I don't know what the hell he was talking about with Kushida, but you know, it's weird that they really went out of their way to leave. I, again, I know this is a tag team match coming up, but it seems like they really went out of their way to leave the X Division title out of it because they don't want us to remember that Zachary Wentz is the number one contender for the X Division championship. And and if I remember correctly, because I, I may be wrong, I think they're taking on the Hardys and Ace Austin at um at turning point. So I think that's what the promo was about. I kind of tuned the promo out. I'm not gonna lie to you. Next match on the card. Well, first we got the personnel concierge. That's my dad. But don't worry, he's cool. Really? <laughs> he doesn't look cool. And this was Ash by Elegance. Come on, Teddy. Come on! Taking on Jody Threat. Tell me right now that I'm just a job. Tell me to my face. You're just that- a job. So Tom Hannafin's word of the day was frenetic. Let me look up frenetic here real quick. This was used to uh, describe Jody Threat. Frenetic, fast, energetic, and uncontrolled. Again, who talks like that. I don't have the most extensive vocabulary in the world. Like extensive is the biggest word I will use today. Okay. But when you're doing commentary, you have to use terminology that the average person knows and understands. Not your word of the day, Tom. Anyway, this match was okay. It wasn't that good. Um, Ash has not put out, I don't think she put on a good match yet that Jordan Grace wasn't involved in. So it's like when she's out there, you got to keep it pretty quick. Now, when they become, when they start doing, once they win the tag team titles, because they're going to Ash and Heather, um, and you got Heather in the ring more because she's a better worker, then you know hopefully it's able to cover up some of the flaws of Ash by Elegance in the ring. Has there ever been a a female wrestler so athletic? that we've that we've seen um have a completely complete inability to transfer that to the ring it does not her athleticism doesn't wrestling she does the swanton at the end the rarefied air but other than that when they um when she was debuting on nxt years and years and years ago you know they ran a lot of video package talk about she was a fitness this and this you know she would come out to the ring and um I don't remember what the the name of the flip is, but she would she would kind of it's some kind of gymnastic move where you you uh it's like a cartwheel, but your hands don't touch the ground. If that if you understand what I'm talking about, so someone who's just got this high degree of of, of athleticism, like she might even arguably be the best best athlete in the knockouts division, but it just does not translate to her wrestling at all. It's very strange. Anyway, she has this match match with Jody Threat. She beats Jody Threat because they need an excuse for Heather and Ash to wrestle for the titles. Like, spoiler, you don't really need an excuse because you're the only tag team out there. There's Masha, not Masha, but uh, Alicia and uh, Tasha out there. They haven't really established themselves as a tag team yet, even though they've been hanging out. It's more of an excuse to find something for Tasha Steeles to do. But... This is a little much for me. I'm all for some storylines and, and giving some justifications, but we're we're just having these teams wrestle each other one on one until one you know until um, Ash and Heather rack up enough victories to justify their their title shot. So 
I mean, really, this is a div- division where you just hand out you, you just hand out title shots. So you might as well do it for this too. But whatever. Um, Ash gets the win after um, Jody Threat, just as Danny Luna did a couple weeks ago, conveniently rolls herself into place for Ash to hit the rare fried air and gets the win. Um, after that, we got uh, Mike Santana in the That's ring. That's nasty. So there's two people we're going to hear from every single week. Mike Santana and Joe Hendry. That is that is going to happen on every single episode. Happened last week, the week before it happened here. So uh, we're always going to hear them hear them speak. So I've been praising all the Mike Santana stuff lately. All these backstage. Uh, they're not backstage, but they're video packages that they're doing. I've, st- I've said that they're very effective, that they should do it for more people. This didn't do it for me. This promo here did not do it for me. Like, obviously, he can talk. But when you get on the microphone, because a lot of baby faces do this promos, promo. Same with, dude, if you watch, like, the NBA draft, NFL draft, they even cut the same promo after they're drafted. Everyone told me I wasn't good enough. I wasn't going to make it. I, I can't relate to that because I've had negative people in my life that have, maybe said those kind of things but i cut them out of i don't um i don't allow them to dictate anything about my life i only surround myself around positive people so i don't have uh individuals on a regular basis that i'm surrounding myself telling me i'm not good enough i can't do it so i i just don't relate to that and i don't think the average human being actually operates like that i, I don't think you know you guys I'm talking to all you. I don't think you have a circle uh, of people around you being negative and telling you you're never going to make it in life. You know, like the minute someone tells me something like that, I cut them out of my life and worry about the positive people. So I don't. It sounds good. Again, athletes do the same thing. Uh, it sounds good. I just don't think it's like a realistic scenario. And then he's saying, I'm one of the best professional wrestlers in the world. That's ev- everybody. Everyone's saying that. That's everybody's gimmick. And it, as much as Vince McMahon was clowned over the years for don't say wrestling, don't say superstar. On, I mean, uh, calling them superstars. Don't say professional wrestling. Professional wrestlers on TV were superstars. As much as that's been clowned over the years, I get it now. Because... Now that um, everyone's trying to prove what real professional wrestling is, they just name drop pro wrestling, professional wrestling, professional wrestler. I'm the best wrestler. It's like nonstop throughout the shows. And like I've said to you guys a few times, WWE established what professional wrestling is. Sports entertainment is actually professional wrestling. I, I know that. I know that a lot of fans say, no, at the core, it's this and this and this. You're not wrong, but the po- what was established in the mainstream as professional wrestling is what WWE does. So this whole, it just comes off super indie to me when people are sitting here, I'm the best wrestler. You're one of the best wrestlers. We're going to have a wrestling match. See who's the best wrestler. Like I totally get Vince McMahon's vision now. Anyway, Frankie Kazarian comes out. Um, Frankie Kazarian, they use, he is a, I understand he has the call your shot gauntlet, but he's a crutch. Every time that a, that a baby face needs someone to feud with, like a strong heel, it's Frankie Kazarian. Like there's just no other options of someone that you can bring in and like where you're having good matches and the both of you can talk and, and, you know, like Frankie's that guy. He's, he has become very much of a crutch. Um, but he comes out and, um, Oh, and, you know, Santana also talking about, I scratch and clawed my way. I mean, it's all terminology that every wrestler uses. Um, and it's, it just doesn't do it for me personally. But him and Frankie, they go back and forth. Santana said, you know, good thing you bring up Turning Point. I don't have a match. Frankie said, oh, I don't have a match either. I'm taking the night off. And they're creating... Uh, they're going to go one-on-one at turning point. So Mike Santana is going to go find Santino, which is pretty easy to do because he's everywhere. You notice everyone has to go find Santino. Like he doesn't have a cell phone. Like they can't just call like, Hey, let's, you know, let's do this. 
Santino talks to uh, what's his fuck all the time in the uh, Tom Hannafin. You know, I just heard from Santino, but they always have to go find Santino. Anyway, this match at Turning Point, I don't know how they're going to book it. It's going to be really interesting. It's going to be one of the better matches on the show. But Santana needs a win. Frankie needs a win. But they're also like very content with beating Frankie, even though we're supposed to buy him right now as uh, a potential number one contender for the title. And WWE has done this too. The Money in the Bank guy just loses every single match, and that's supposed to throw you off from when they're going to cash in. So I think that's what TNA is doing with Frankie Kazarian. I think they're going to be very content with him losing. Um, and when he does win, it's not going to be decisive, like we're about to talk about here in a sec. So I don't know what they're going to do. I've been saying this the last couple of weeks. I am I am convinced in my heart of hearts that TNA wants Mike Santana to be the champion. That's why he's get. That's why we hear from him. Every, excuse me, blah, blah, blah. We hear from him every week. We get video packages packages from him on a very regular basis. He's a very important part of the show, and I'm I appreciate it because even though he's name dropping the world title, he's still doing his thing off to the side. He is not involved with Nick Nemeth really. He's not really involved with Joe Hendry. He was a few weeks ago, like kind of wrestling tag tagging with these guys, but he is kind of forging his own path off to the side. So I do really appreciate that. But I've pointed out to you guys many times, this is a company that stays the course. They do not, uh, they have not shown that they, they change course very well. Like they know who they want to be the champions and they know, okay, we're going to get, we're, this is you know at the beginning of the year they say okay these are who we want our champions to be and we're going to work towards that what happened with joe hendry was very organic it's the most organic thing that's happened in the company since the broken hardies as far as getting new viewers um, gaining interest from the outside the most organic thing since the broken hardies so with the hardies it's very easy to do a storyline where they win the tag team championships that's that's no big deal Joe Hendry is a guy that they had in the mid card, solidified in the mid card, and it's kind of like, oh shit, we we have to put the title on him now. So that messes things up because we had plans for Nick Nemeth, we have plans for Mike Santana, and probably Frankie Kazarian too. There's a chance that he wins. I think there's a chance he wins the title, but it'll be like a very short reign. But I also, in my gut, think that Joe Hendry is going to have a very short reign as well. I. I been saying this probably the last three weeks. My heart of hearts, they want Mike Santana to be the champion, and they're going to get there. They're gonna, they're they're pivoting here a little bit because they have no choice, but they know where they want to go. They know who they want to be champion. They knew when they signed Mike Santana that they were going to make him champion, and they're going to get there sooner than later. I promise you. Um, yeah. So after this this transition out of this promo into uh, the next match, Frankie Kazarian. So I'm not playing with y'all, bro. He is king of the block party, and he took on the Vietnam War machine, Rhino. Tell us about the war, any one of them. And I, I wasn't like real engaged in this match because I just don't get engaged into Rhino matches. But the commentary team is like consistently telling us about this 13 year feud these two have had, but they haven't also haven't wrestled one on one in 13 years. I don't care. Let me let me hit it. I'm here to tell you right now. We don't care. Let me tell, right, let me tell you. <laughs> we don't care. I do not care about the history of Frankie Kazarian and Rhino even a little bit. They, they, they tried to uh, promote that a little bit last week, and they are here too. And like, I don't care. If you want to say these guys are having a fight because Frankie screwed him at the call your shot gauntlet, okay, I can get that. But don't. Don't pitch this like we're rehashing a 13-year rivalry. They've wrestled each other throughout their entire careers. Like, I, I, I have no recollection of these people, uh, of them ever touching each other. They were in other companies. Like, I just, I, I Frankie Zarin was in AEW for a long time. Was Ring of Honor. Uh, the Rhino was in WWE for a long time. Like, I don't even, I don't know what he's talking about, honestly. You guys probably know um, a lot better than me. Frankie Kazarian ultimately wins a match uh and, and it's uh, it was either a goofy roll up or a nut shot i don't remember exactly i don't that's how he beat rhino at 
call your shot gauntlet, right? Like you cheated, nut shot, roll up. Why are we still doing that for for the rematch? Just have Frankie beat him. Like we're trying to, you're trying to uh, give him a little momentum before he has to wrestle Mike Santana. So have him have him get a decisive win. Like what does Rhino? What do you have to cheat against Rhino for? Rhino is one of the guys though that when he's on the card, the company says we have to give the people the gore. Forget that half the roster does spears. We have to give the people the gore because the people want to see the gore. So whether Rhino wins or loses, he gores the opponent. That happens about 90% of the time. It's like the Swanton bomb with Jeff Hardy or the, the twist of fate. It doesn't matter what the result is of the match or what kind of match it is, how how they lay it out. We're, they feel like they have the crowd has to get those moves. And the gore is one of them. So I just thought it made Frankie look kind of goofy because he's supposed to go into this match with Mike Santana and he he is on his ass you know so to, for what to keep rhino strong like for what what reasons the commentary through this match was very goofy the commentary through the show was was very goofy and we're not going to make fun of tom hannafin but the the commentary was very like joking joking back and forth and tom fake laughing and it told me that i could be totally wrong but Typically, when they're that goofy on commentary, it's because they're, the matches weren't supposed to be televised to begin with. You know, they're like, so next week they're doing this vault episode, which I will not watch. And I think they said PCO is taking on Moose in a casket match. PCO doesn't lose. So, and Moose is your X Division champion. So, are you, is it really worth showing this match if PCO is going to beat him? And he's, so whatever. Anyway, that's irrelevant. But, Whenever they have these vault matches, if you do watch them, the commentary is always really, really goofy. They're joking back and forth. They're fake. That's what like this whole episode, a lot of that, it happened a lot of this episode, but spe- 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 specifically with this match. So I'm not even so sure that this was supposed to air, but, you know, I don't know. I don't care. I don't care because I don't care about Rhino. After this was a very good a little long and I was a little lost, but very good uh, kind of video vignette thing, whatever they did of Steve Macklin. And he was drinking at the bar and it's showing that he's um, kind of having some PTSD flashbacks. They mentioned last week in the match that he was a machine gunner. That's pretty cool. Your boy was a machine gunner. Um, I was for four years, probably like my first four years when I joined. Um, and at the time, there's very few of us because I joined prior to the war, the war kicked off like a year later. So my first three deployments, I was, I was a machine gunner um, because there was very few of us. Like I said, like now they certify all sorts of people just because, you know, we were in wartime for how many years, whatever. But I thought that was cool um, to know that about him. I didn't know that. Maybe they said it before. I don't know, but now you know that about me. So um, this was a little long, like I said, and they're, they're factoring King of the Ra Ra, Eric Young into this thing. Like they're at a bar, and after Steve Macklin leave, leaves, then it shows Eric Young conveniently come to the bar, and the bar, you know, the bartender's like, "Can I get you anything?" I didn't really understand that. Like I didn't understand what his involvement is, and then it shows. I thought he was sitting down for counseling, but it shows Steve Macklin sitting down for. Um, uh, I guess he was supposed to talk to the police or something, but it was Eric Young. So I don't know if it's he's just seeing Eric Young. I'm not going to lie. This just kind of went so long for me that I started, my my ADHD was like really kicking in and I was not following where they were going with it. I just know that it was pretty cool. It was shot very well. The acting was good. You know, they, they brought in the bartender and she looked like she can act. She might've been a wrestler for all we know, but you know, the acting was fine. It wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't bad acting. Uh, but I think they're trying to turn Eric Young heel here. I don't really know they're going with it, but I've I've got some interest. Macklin is dealing with Josh Alexander. He's dealing with Eric Young. I can very much see Eric Young taking over the Northern Armory when, uh, Josh Alexander, if Josh Alexander leaves. And I think that's my, might be what they're planning for. I don't know. Um, yeah, it was very well done. 
Eric Young, the star of Vinyl Obsession. I'm here to tell you right now, we don't care. Let me tell, right, let me tell you. <laughs> we don't care. After this, we had a um, tag team match. Moose. Damn you, Moose. And JDC. These are spirit fingers. And these are gold. Versus Leon Slater and the number one contender for the Digital Media Championship, Laredo Kid. Very, very random match. Very random tag team match. The match was fine because everyone can work. The outcome was really was really weird because they decided that Moose and JDC were going to lose here to two guys that, frankly, don't beat anybody. Um, I mean, Leon Slater, at best, is like 50-50. Laredo Kid doesn't beat anybody. I, I have beat Laredo Kid, all right? So what was really weird here was that Leon Slater gets the win. He pins JDC. But then Telegraph and Tom is, you know, after the match, because there, there's a beat down, because there has to be after the match. Laredo Kid comes in with a chair and he hits JDC. He hits Moose. The guy who beats nobody getting the upper hand on a couple of the top stars. Telegraph and Tom's like, he's standing up against Moose, uh, you know, a week before turning point. So and then he's letting us know, okay, they're, they're going to have a match. And this is the difference, though, between like creative and or being creative and have, making an excuse to have two people fight. And that's what this is. They want Moose to defend it in the X Division Championship against Laredo Kid, who's probably disappointed he's not getting his digital media title shot instead. Um, but they want to give him the match. So they have this weird finish where, I mean, like, he didn't even win the match. He could have very easily just pinned um, JDC, and they could have got the desired outcome: throw Laredo Kid out of the mat, out of the ring, beat down Leon Leon Slater, and then he can come back with the chair. You know what I mean? But at least have him win the match. At least have him pin JDC. You know, so that's what they're going to do at Turning Point because they feel like they have to put every title on the line. And they, you know, before Bound for Glory, the whole. Edward, the, the uh, Alicia Edwards and Masha Angle when Alicia got hurt and they're talking to, she was saying oh I know that we have to defend the title every 30 days so if that's your justification why Moose is defending the title on the show against Laredo Kid and which is essentially like a throwaway match where's PCO defending his title when was the last time he defended his title it was bound for glory right like I feel like we're going to exceed 30 days for Moose to I mean, not Moose, but PCO to defend his titles. So, like, have some kind of consistency. But I, I don't know. that. Like, to me, this is just, like, an excuse for Moose to defend the title. And they needed to, you know, needed to give him a, a beatable opponent. They look like they're trying to build up to Leon Slater eventually. I just have a hard time seeing them get there. But when they're saying Leon Slater said his goal was to be the youngest X Division champion, well, they're going to do that. Usually when they say stuff like that, they are forecasting what is going to happen. The only time they like really missed on that. Remember Jake something when he promised that he was going to and guaranteed us he was going to win the X Division Championship this year. I don't think that's going to happen. So yeah, we're going to get Moose versus Laredo Kid. This should not be a competitive match. If you are selling Moose as the the no limits guy and the heavyweight in the division. He's got to have to. He has to run through some people. This can't be AEW where everything's competitive. No one's. No one gets momentum. You know they're going twenty minutes with a jobber before the pay per view, where they're you're supposed to believe they're going to beat you know whoever. So Moose cannot go twenty minutes with Laredo Kid here. If you want to get Laredo Kid a little offense, whatever. Moose needs to have a decisive win here. That's going to establish. That's going to establish your X division under moose so um i understand they want to give them some rando opponents but uh, again there's just a there's just a, a difference between creatively getting there and then just making an excuse for for a match after this we are hearing from joe hendry Believe that. and as i said we're going to hear from joe hendry and mike santana every episode there's it's just going to happen every single week. And he's coming out and attempting to be a little bit more serious. He's starting from the bottom. We know he's going to win the championship. 
But the story is he has to start from the bottom. It would have made more sense for me if Nick Nemeth pinned him clean because they justify rematches all the time on this show. And this one match where Nick, where, where Joe Hendry legitimately got screwed, Santino's making him start from the bottom. But it's fine. You know, we got to kill some time. We're, they're trying to build up to when we know Joe Hendry is going to win the title at Genesis. He's entered himself in the turkey trot, whatever the hell. The match is all semi-main eventers and John Schuyler. We already know John Schuyler is going to wear the fucking turkey suit. I don't even know why they're there. These guys shouldn't even, you shouldn't even be putting these guys in match. Like PCO is now appearing. He's going to wrestle in this thing. Hammerstone, Brian Myers. Like none of these guys should be wearing the turkey suit. They shouldn't even be involved in this. It's typically a jobber match, but obviously you can't promote a jobber match. So you have to throw some kind of guys with status in there. But they're promoting the shit out of this this turkey suit match. Joe Hendry will likely get the win. I'm, I'm Actually, I can bet my balls on it. He is going to pin whoever loses. So it's going to be John Schuyler because they're going to try to push Joe Hendry in the process. He's not, he's not just going to participate in this. He's going to win the match as well. So uh, he will pin John Schuyler. John Schuyler will be in a turkey suit. If anyone else from that group is in the turkey suit, it is awful, awful booking on uh, the behalf of TNA. Then we got backstage and st- in front of purple, pink, red, yellow lights, the TNA world champion, Nick Nemeth. I've been talking to people walking here. We've been talking about next year, and I'm sitting there saying, I'm not going to be here. <laughs> I've, I've pointed this out before. Uh, Mike Gilbert just, pointed, just, just, uh, just picked up on this. He was talking about it an episode or two ago. Nick Nemeth is a sweet-ass deal. He shows up for one day of tapings. Does his matches. It's like he is never there. He is not there for the entire thing. Like you can very much tell that all this stuff is done on the first day. He's like, hey, fuck you, pay me. Now I'm out. You know, so pretty sweet gig. I wouldn't be surprised if the Hardys didn't have that as well, but they did wrestle in this episode. So I don't know. Um, yeah, you never know in what order they tape these matches, though. But Nick Nemeth is like clearly always there for, for a match or for a day, uh, does his shit, and then he, he bounces. So he, he's cutting a promo. I'm not listening to anything he's saying, to be honest with you, because I can't. I just keep seeing the, the freaking lights. After this, Savannah Evans. That's a huge bitch. She goes one-on-one with jobber Brittany Jade. It doesn't even go here. They are... They are um, They've completely written laying Lee off TV. I mean, I'm not saying they wrote her off TV. She hasn't been there in three weeks. All she did was take the full Nelson slam from Savannah Evans, and she hasn't come back. She hasn't cut her promo. She hasn't tried to attack her in the ring. Nothing. Like, she's completely on the shelf from this uh, this full Nelson slam. And you, when you're waiting so long, I just have a hard time thinking that she's – this isn't Marty Jannetty returning uh, to attack Shawn Michaels. You know what I mean? Like three weeks later, four weeks later, whenever she's going to show up, like she cannot be that pissed off anymore. You know what I mean? But she's going to probably come in and, <sighs> but it's like, you've really killed it because she's completely off TV. I'm not saying I want them to wrestle right away. Cause you want to kind of build it up a little bit, but it's just weird that this, she's just completely off TV. So uh, yeah, Brittany Jade, I pointed out before, if a girl gets some offense, they're probably looking at her. I don't think they're looking at Brittany Jade because she she did not last long. She looks pretty green, kind of some cheap tattoos. Um, could probably tone up a little bit. Uh, pretty girl, though. But she looks like she's got a lot of work to do to get there. Um, but she So she jobbed out here pretty quick to Savannah Evans. Then we have um, Masha Slamovich. Very randomly backstage, looking adoringly at her X division, not her X division, but her knockouts division championship. Jordan Grace very conveniently walks up. Uh, they Masha wrestled in the opening match of the show, and her and Jordan went backstage together. So you would think they'd have this conversation then, but instead, Jordan walked away and then showed up at the very end of the episode, saying, "Man, you know, talking about the opening match and and whatever." I thought it was a little community theater, but. 
that's not what's important. What's important is this is going to be two out of three falls at turning point, which I think is a very logical progression because we've seen them wrestle so many times. And you got to really, really put Masha over here. Because Jordan, Jordan's ready to go. She's ready to bounce. You know what I mean? Um, and they failed. We talk about this all the time. They failed to prepare themselves for the departures of the Dianas and the and, and the Mickeys and the um, uh, Trinities and all that. Like they're doing now. They are preparing themselves for the departure of Jordan Grace by by getting these these wins and really pushing Masha Slamovich. And Jordan said, "I'll text you later." Which again, very funny because they had a blood feud two, three weeks ago. So they're going to do two out of three falls. It'll probably main event the show. Sounds like it's going to be a real show stealer. I know Nick Nemeth keeps saying I'm going to steal the show, he, but he doesn't. He never does. Um, these girls are going to steal the show. This is going to be uh, an incredible match. I'm actually very, very, very much looking forward to it. Then we get the main event of this episode. Oh, it was Trent, I'll have a number seven. I don't want lunch. I want breakfast. Clearly, I wasn't talking to you, big titties. You cherub-looking motherfucker. And his tag team partners representing the X Division, the team of Hammerstone and Jake something. Loud noises! I don't know what we're yelling about! And they're taking on Ace Austin. Is this your card? Yes, oh my gosh. It's it's not, is it? <clears throat> no, uh And the Hardys. Wonderful. Oh, and I kick out. So very good main event. The um I I mentioned this last week. It's very weird seeing the two jacked up dudes on the roster with the guy with like the worst physique on the roster and they're a team. But whatever. Jake uh not Jake, but Trent Seven had the heel turn, getting a little bit of a push. Unfortunately, Mike Bailey did not stick around enough to put Trent Seven over. But what I'm thinking personally is that Mike Bailey wasn't about to take two losses. And they didn't want to take, like he didn't personally on his record or or how he was perceived to take two losses before going to AEW. That's what I, I think happened. The company didn't want to put the belt on Trent. I'll have a number seven. So they uh, they had him drop the title to Moose, which I'm cool with. And then he just kind of bounced. It, it, to get Trent Seven over, Trent turned heel on him. That was that was it. He wasn't going to lose the Trent, and we're going to have a match, and we're going to have a feud. But Mike Bailey was clearly willing to look like a goof on the way out to um, to elevate Trent a little bit. So, you know, we'll see what uh, we'll see what Trent does with a little bit more of a push. Uh, but it was a good main event, good six-man tag. It's good to see Jake and Hammerstone involved in the main event because they put this team together, and these guys don't wrestle for shit. They don't have tag team matches, singles matches. They're not even on the damn show. You know, right after we're kind of like, oh, what are these guys going to do as a team? So um, the naked tandem and Jake, some, Jake something, the naked tandem and Trent Seven ultimately get the win here. Uh, they cheat, of course, at the end. Uh, Trent Seven gets the pin with the burning hammer onto Ace Austin. I laugh because there was one point where Ace Austin, with because he had the Jeff Hardy face paint, he turned to the camera and he looked like uh, fucked up Jeff Hardy from when he wrestled Sting. If it was a Victory Road, I don't remember exactly what the what the show was, but he looked like fucked up Jeff Hardy. So it was kind of funny. I wanted to screenshot it, but you can't screenshot TNA Plus. So maybe I'll try to find it on YouTube, put it on Twitter or something. But that that shit made me laugh. Um, when when Trent Seven and the the naked guys won, I said to myself because I say this all the time, they will not go off the air with a heel winning or a heel with their hands in the air. They will not do it. They just don't. They haven't ever since I've covered this company for like eight or nine years that I've been doing this. They will not do it. The show always has to end with something that makes the fan like you're trying to send the fans home happy. They refuse to 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 do it with heat. So. Trent Seven gets a pin. Of course, there's a, a post-match angle. And then uh, the Rascals and Kushida run down and chase them off. And we're going off the air with those three guys in the ring. A again, excuses, not creative. Because why are they even having a match? I I'm, I'm trying to go back to a couple weeks ago when they kind of 
paired Trent Seven with with Hammerstone and something, Jake something. I'm trying to go back to that, and I'm like, was the, was the Rascals involved in that? You know, like I, I'm disconnected from it. I don't know why they're fighting. Is what I'm saying. You guys might remember. I'm I'm trying to like really rewind in my head why why are they having a match what is the what is the heat here and if they did establish something on tv i just don't think it was very long lasting because i don't remember what it is good episode good episode of impact uh we will be back i'm not going to watch the that episode next week i'm just telling you right now i take it as a break like uh, as much as I don't want the company to phone it in during the holidays, I'm not totally tripping on the other ha- other hand because it gives me a break from having to watch the show. So, um, turning point, I think that's Friday or Saturday. I'm going to be out of town for Thanksgiving. I'll be back home in California, so I don't know how that's going to work. I don't know when I'm going to watch Turning Point. I don't know when I'm going to review it. So it might be delayed a little bit, not to the point I did Maple Leaf Pro. I promise it's not going to be six months, six weeks later, but it's definitely going to be um, a little bit later. I just I have to imagine if I'm being realistic with myself. So that'll do it for me this week, folks. I'm your boy BQ. I'm out. Peace.